I was ranting. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So, shh. It was so interesting, the topic. I loved it. Yeah, you can come up, please. I, I don't want to stand here alone. So, um, yeah. I have great people joining me today for the panel of new work models within hospitality. Shh. <laughs> Um, and I would love, as we have a lot of time, we have 45 minutes, I know we have a lot to talk about, but we have enough time, I think, that you all could um, introduce yourselves and um, tell us what you do and why you think that you are the right people to speak to us on this, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on this topic. So, go ahead, Svenja. Thank you so much for that question. So my name is Svenja Gossing. I work as the country host for the Power MBA and um, I also am a digital entrepreneur. I did a lot of um, HR transformation in my back past. So I think new work definitely was a continuous topic in my career. And so that's why I would love to share my opinion today. Perfect, love it. Um, my name is Philip Ibrahim. I have no clue yeah. why I'm the right person <laughs> to be on stage, but I'll try to uh, manage. I just out. learned that uh, that's one of the male gifts to just come up and talk. No, but I think, to be honest, it's, it's, uh, it's rather hard after the last panel because I really got to give kudos. That was very amazing. And I, for all who have not watched it, make sure to watch it online. That was quite good. So thank you for that. Well, I hope that I can learn from you guys what I can do better in the future. So I'm standing here and ready to learn. <laughs> Uh, Daniel Johnson, I'm uh, uh, co-founder of Venza, and I, I couldn't agree uh, more about how this is, actually I think this conversation is uh, the natural extension, extension yeah. to that last conversation. Um, uh, myself, uh, my, my company, we've been in business for 14 years, and we've, we've seen an evolution of, um, of the way we do work in those, it doesn't sound like maybe a lot of time, but it, it is, it's, it's really remarkable, especially in the last 18 months or so, how things have changed in the way we're doing work. And so we went from kind of a lot of traditionals, baby boomers in, in, our, in our team to, uh, to millennials, and it's been an, kind of an incredible trans, trans, transition. So maybe that's why uh, you guys asked for me to be here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alexandra. I'm uh, with HRS for over 10 years and I'm working at a company that is reinventing the way travelers work, stay and pay for 50 years. So a startup that still is very grown up. And why am I here? So, um, so having this purpose in mind, making business travel life worth living. Um, I also am in the people business. So I'm also taking care of um, HR or people solutions. And I'm very much a friend or a fan of um, there is no disruption that happens to you. You have to disrupt yourself. And this is why I'm, um, I think I can add some of uh, my experience, but also the way how I see the future of work happening. And this is an active process. This is not something where we just sit there and hope, but where we engage for the better. And this is potentially why you invited me. Cool. Uh, so I'm Dorian Wilson Debriano, I'm the co-founder of uh, Yance Life. Um, so I have a little bit of a different track record because uh, I used to be in hospitality, uh, worked for over five years in um, advertising and working with hotel with hotels um, to increase distribution. And now I've passed on to a different direction, started my own company focused on health and wellness. So I think that the main reason why I'm on this panel is uh, to be able to is exactly that, is to be able to kind of bridge how are we actually approaching health and wellness in companies, in hotels, and how are we giving this back to our employees, and how does all of this work together, and how do we feel good actually from, or, or feel good from actually any type of workplace and where, where we're working to be able to actually bring out that output that's actually expected of us, and especially now as the world is changing. Absolutely. So I think we all know that um, we are in big trouble, our industry is in big trouble if we don't change our perspective on working at site on a hotel, but also in tech companies. So um, Svenja, what does new work models mean? Can you just give us like a bit from scratch? Because we are all talking about it basically because of COVID, oh, home office, etc., etc. But that's not only that, right? 
Yeah, correct. So if we talk about new work, it actually, this, this term refers back to Friedrich Bergmann, um, who actually started thinking about the new way of working already back in the 70s. Back then, it was impacting the industry um, pretty much um, due to automation, which was going on in the, in the car industry. And so he realized that there is a certain alienation of um, people from their work. So he said, hey, work has to be differently designed. So if we nowadays use that term, of course, we have a different context nowadays. We talk about our work industry being heavily affected by digitalization, by COVID and so forth. And that, again, revolves in new ways of working, meaning on the one hand side, the processes, the, the models which we applied before, the leadership style is heavily impacted. And on the other hand, we actually have workforce people coming in, millennials, and also the, the um, generations that with a totally different outlook, which a different also drive to technology, which was just not there before. So for me, it's not even a question about willingness to change. It's a little bit like the sustainable topic. Sorry, we do have to change for sure. Um, well, I, I think you all always mention how long you're in the industry. I remember when I started in the industry, I still had to do split shifts. Um, and if we talk about old work and new work, I, I know no hotel today where you still do split shifts, probably somewhere in the more rural region and if it's requested by staff uh, members. But um, I think that's a bit the difference in the working mentality. And I like what you said about leadership. I think the biggest shift or the biggest change we see is in the way how we lead people. Um, we're coming from an industry where it was quite normal to follow some sort of hierarchy. Uh, when you look in the kitchen teams, there still is a high amount of hierarchy where there's the last word the chef announces and the rest has to repeat. So sometimes it's quite funny even today to stand in the kitchen because you see people still working in the same way where he says, it's a soup. Yes, yeah, soup coming. Yes, chef. And it's sometimes a bit, a bit weird for me. But if you look into the new work models and especially not only in uh, the time frames, it is more on who leads who. And if we look back at the panel before, I think that was quite an example because it's, um, um, let, no, let, let me rephrase that. When in 2015 the whole um, refugees came to Germany, I did a lot of uh, um, meetings with refugees where I explained them if you want to do an Ausbildung, a German apprenticeship, then you have to be aware that whether you're from a Muslim or patriotic uh, uh, race background, it could be that the people that lead you are either younger or even worse, women and younger. And that really had to be something you say in advance. And if I look into that, that's what our industry is. Sometimes you have somebody who's 40 or 35, and he's led by somebody who's 24 and has more experience. And that's something that is, might be, or that might have had an impact as well on the way how we work and who we recruit tomorrow. Uh -huh. So I think that's a bit uh, the change. Absolutely. And Daniel, uh, yeah? Yeah. So. I have so many thoughts on this new work thing. It's just, I'm just brimming with ideas. Yeah, have a seat. No, no, no. Um, so on Monday, uh, I think it was Monday or Tuesday. Today is Thursday, right? So I think it was Monday. The Seattle Times had a headline that said, Amazon employees uh, no longer, did you see this? Yeah, no. No, no longer uh, or will be able to continue to work remotely indefinitely. Wow, what a forward-thinking organization. Of course, they're only talking about, and that belies the headline, less than 5% of employees of Amazon. So, again, the adage, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. So when you're talking about people in the, in the, in the kitchen, and we talk about new work, and we think we're being really progressive, there is a sizable, a massive, more than the majority of those of us in the human race that are that just have it's out of their reach to be able to experience this kind of this kind of lifestyle and i think covid has shown a very bright light on that you've got people that have the luxury of being able to work remote and what happened fewer fewer people within that community contracted the virus. Why? Because they have the luxury of being working from home, and you have in huge increase in their in their amount of uh, uh, of income. They continue to work, and so they have this in this huge increase in uh, in disposable income. Meanwhile, the others among us that don't have that luxury, 
continue to go out to work, continue to face, you know, the perils of having to be stacking, you know, stacking uh, shelves in, in the supermarket, distributing Amazon packages, etc. So this is, I think this is a, a, there are all sorts of potential things that are really encouraging the idea of getting people to, you know, think about a new type of uh, the hierarchies, as you're saying, people to experience the new corporate currency of, of enjoying a digital nomad lifestyle. Wonderful things, but not to be Danny Downer. This is, this is a subset of all of us that are able to experience this. So let's not fool ourselves that that is a brave new world and it's really, it's really uh, uh, you know, fairy tales and, and uh, uh, rainbows and butterflies for a lot of us. It's really outside of the reach for big swaths of, our, of the demographic. Can I tech on that, Alex? Sorry. Uh, well, I gotta say one thing. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter who it is for. It is what your staff wants from you. And if there is a staff member that works in a fucking, um, I don't know, kitchen, and he requires now to do home office, then he has the wrong job. And then you have to, you have to tell him, hey, good idea, open a delivery service, do it from home. Yeah. So that is what leadership means. So, but at the other end, there might be people, and I experienced that in my team, they could have worked from home. They backed me to be able to come to work and make it happen and possible. So it is not always what we consider majority, minority, what they want. It's about the honesty, how we lead them and which opportunities we give them. And if somebody tells you, man, I, I really am scared of the virus. How can we work? Is there anything we can do? Yeah. And then you sit down with that individual and you find something what suits him. And if that suiting him means yeah. that his career does not follow on on the same track, he has to do something else then it's just honest to do that. And that's what for me new work means. Back then, I could say, whatever, you don't want to go, go and do something else, I, don't, I cannot keep you. But now we're in a world where I have to make things possible. Life example, my F&B manager has two kids and uh, an ex-wife and an ex-girlfriend. So he's quite handicapped, I would say, because his ex-wife wanted to take the one kid one week and the other kid the other week. So he looked at me, how should I do that? I said, Jose, don't you worry. Bring all kids here. We'll, we'll open a meeting room. I'll bring my son when he's here. We do whatever we want. Let them play, let them paint the walls. I don't care. And that gave a, took a lot of pressure from him because the whole crisis, he could basically do what he want. And when he told me, I cannot come tomorrow, I want to work from home, I said, hey, fine, bro. Speak to you on whatever, Teams, whatever we did. So it's a bit finding the individual needs of our staff, and that's what the change is, yeah. back to them. That's agility, agility as a leader. Alexandra, do you experience more or less the same thing? Because it, it, now it is a hotel uh, perspective, but for example... Yeah, so I think HRS? you have to have the broader picture and saying, okay, is it new work is not just about remote working. So in numbers, we talk about 35% roughly of the people that can overall work remotely. So we have a lot of industries that need servers despite all digitization, which we for sure enforce also in hospitality. Clear thing. To your question, I think it's more about do I have a strategy and do I know what as an employer I have to offer? It's always like the thing in marketing and do I find the right customer or I don't say that necessarily the employee is a customer, but you could view it like that because we are living in a reality where we are all, wherever we are in the value chain, are competing for talent. Now the point is, to your point, Ibrahim, the, the point is what do you have to offer and what do you want to have in return? And that very much goes into, in the, in the good old, I would say, marketing, you start with what's my why, then you go about how and what do I offer? And here it must be super clear if you have a culture where you say, hey, we meet more than, we have five days a week and we want to meet more than we don't want to meet, working synchronous and co-located, because this is what we do three days a week, then this is my model, this is what I have to offer and I am a true believer, not because I'm in a generation where I started in 2002 with working, so kind of, you know, some experience on um, non-remote work, it's that the human creativity and the way how you bond people. Everyone's talking about post-pandemic, psychological safety, sense of belonging. I can swear to God, so the last 18 months were none walk of the, uh, in a park for no one, I guess. For the hospitality industry, it was very strong. 
And um, what I sensed is that people want to belong. So the human creativity, despite everything what now is going to happen, and you can scale it via Zoom and other, other devices, make it much more intelligent, much more efficient. We humans need each other to, to scale our creativity and also to create something bigger. I don't believe that this is just happening via Zoom. You can now talk about all those different models, are there meetings and workshops that you can do in a different manner? But at the end, this is what it boils down to. And if you ask me, so as an employer, I have to be very creative in terms of saying, okay, this is my value proposition. And if you want to become an entrepreneur inside the company, this is what it takes. And then to your point, we can always talk about flexibility or other requirements, how we come together and create this workplace for sure. Absolutely. I have uh, been talking to you, Svenja, already today, and uh, we talked about uh, work-life balance and how long it took us to get there, and then how short it was actually to take that away and say, ah, oh, that's old, let's go to work-life. How did you say? In, I said blending, and you said another word? Work-life integration. So that was a much quicker step to do because to get to work-life balance, especially probably in Germany, because we have a lot of working mentality, a high working mentality. And um, there you come in probably, right? Yeah. So motivating people. So, for, for, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so first thing, first thing, I, I mean, I'm a little bit sick of this work-life balance topic. It's a little bit what we talked about it earlier as well. I mean, in the end, by the way, what we're talking about when we think about new work, when we think about how the industries, all industries are changing, it's not about, and there I'll argue a little bit with you on it, is it's not just about what do employers have to offer. It's actually new expectations from employees, not just about what they want to work or where they want to work, but about the, their overall experience throughout their life. Because work is where we spend more than 50% of our time. So work is not work and then life or all these types of things. It's all a part of, a part of our life. So where I come in at this point is about actually the question of what's the responsibility that a company takes today in the wellness and in the life, actually, life wellness of their employees. This is the question. When we look at hospitality, and if we focus deep dive on hospitality, we've always focused on the guest. The guest is the number one. Every product that we have is for the guest. Every single solution, every budget that we have, we look at it really with the focus on the guest. But we're rarely turning around and looking at it from the employee perspective. And I'll even go further and argue on it, is that it's funny that the biggest motos out there, and I was at hospitality school, so I heard those motos, Ritz-Carlton, where I'm, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. We, uh, you know, Richard Branson about how you need to treat your employees first before in order to get the best outcome for the guest. But when we look at the biggest companies that are focusing on employee wellness, where retention is high, where they're putting huge amounts of time, it's tech, it's some of, the, some of the businesses where there's the least interaction with the, with the customer on the other side because it's all about this focus inward. And when we look at hospitality, we really need to think, now in this crisis, now in what we're going through, can we rethink how we approach our employees so that we can actually fit to their needs? Can I jump on yes, this? Yes, please. So I think um, before we talk about, and I think this is the big shift in it, coming from an HR perspective, is I have to we have to rethink positions. So we came from thinking in organigrams and saying this person does this or that job. I think the new way of thinking about work is what competencies and skills do I need? And then I look into how can I get that? Do I have want to acquire that from the market? Which part of it do I um, acquire and which part do I train? Yeah, for skill, and there's this good old world, yeah, uh, hire for uh, will and then train for skill. But I think this becomes much more important because then you are much more flexible in saying, okay, I'm not looking for that person, so this is really the 80s, or that position, this might be the best of the last 10 years, but now into what do I need in terms of competencies and do I have that inside my organization? Can I create, you know, can I develop people inside or do I look in completely different industries for people that then believe in my brand, in my 
purpose and also make them believers of serving the customer in a way. Can I quickly jump on this? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, because you mentioned, can we look at other industries? It's really interesting because now we've heard it, I think like, you know, maybe 80% of the panels, we heard the same problem. Oh, we're not finding, we're not finding talent. We, in the hospitality, we're not finding talent. Well, there comes that actually all other industries right now, they're really going after hospitality talents yeah. because of the soft skills. Yeah. So now when we're looking at hospitality, when we're thinking, okay, how am I gonna hire? We can also start poaching if we actually make our offers appropriate and attractive. I think exactly. it's super important. Exactly, because the service orientation of the hospitality industry is much wanted, right? So this is it. This makes us attractive. Exactly. I mean, there is this one thing I always say. I think as long as we use the word human resource, we have not uh, understood the shift, yeah. Yeah. to be honest. That's not a fucking resource. That's our issue. These are people. We do it for people. And uh, I, I love to use talent on development. I hate HR, I gotta say. It's just so sticky in our brain. I hate the word human resource. Still, resources. everyone understands it. So but it's is... stupid that we use it because it indicates sure. our issue. Sure. Because how do we, is there any equivalent that we call our client? Like, I don't know, money resource. We, we don't use it. We're very, we're, very, we're very determined when it comes to client. That's what you say and what you say as well. So learning that, that we're doing it for people is like the first thing to, 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 to understand. And then, um, and I, I like what you said, Dorian, especially the offers. We talk about mental health. So what, what we did at Student Hotel to give a life example, we, we decided that, um, well, let's put it the other way around. If you're in my hotel, you have 300 students. They live there and I have, 30 staff members, that makes it 330 people I have to take care of because they all have the same issues. They live with you, they spend more time, I spend more time with them than with probably my son, which is bad enough, but still. But I know each and everything of the problem. So whatever we offer to our students in terms of mental health, we make sure to offer it to our staff as well. So we have a dedicated phone number, we have a dedicated service, everybody can use it when needed. Because sometimes, especially when you have a highly, and that's the change in, in hospitality today, it's not the German ausgebildete, correct, characteristic, hierarchy people that you hire. You hire people that are cool. And sometimes they have been totally in a different job. So sometimes they have no clue what you talk about in your language. So if they feel lost, you have to give them an offer where they can, where they can find uh, uh, guidance. So that's a bit one of the examples that really is a change. And the second thing I wanted to say, the German companies, um, I take, well, I'm, I'm Swabian, so I know automotive, uh, Daimler, Mercedes, they, they they have very clear rules when it comes to timing at work. So during the, the short work, Kurzarbeit in Germany, they were not allowed to work more than a specific hours per week, which is more related to if the state finds out, they would have to pay back all the funds that they get. So I'd get that point from a, from a capitalism side. But it means they couldn't open their laptop. It was not, they were not able to log in the system anymore if they have exceeded the time. And I looked at myself and said, I do understand it from the, from the legal side, but for me, this would be a nightmare. If I cannot work anymore, and I have like four, I, after three days in hospitality, you have used your time, <laughs> run out of time, so I have four days, no access to your computer. I remember, I don't exactly know what my first day at work looks like. It's gonna be hell, and I will not get off the computer. So I think that's a bit the, the, the balance that we have to keep in how do we, penetrate on work, how do we give it on work, and again, a life example of my hotel. My assistant is not like me, she's amazing, but I can go to holiday wherever, sit at the pool, see my kid, and have my phone in my hand, answer emails, and that's, I love it, I love it, it's great, it gives me freedom. She's not like that, she has to go to a, a fucking, um, uh, what is it called, uh, um, Wald forest, a forest where she has no connection with her dog and her boyfriend, and three days she's off. She's off, you cannot reach her. If you have a question, it's your bad luck. So we have to respect these different work mentalities, I think, and that's a bit what, what I think. Can I jump in and pile on an HR for a second? Absolutely. Just, just on the subject of job descriptions, it's something that we established straight away when we, and, and it, was, it, was, it was really hard to get people to adopt, but we don't like to talk about job descriptions because a job description is like a box and a person can fulfill everything in the box, and that might feel good day one, day, day two, it's okay, day three. Day 20, you're like, all I'm doing is I'm fulfilling this box. So we don't talk about that because you could do extra, 
and there's no fulfillment there. You could do you could do less, and there's no fulfillment. There's no fulfillment for the individual. So we talk about accountabilities in our company, something that that you can take on and be accountable for, and it's through that you can access a sense of fulfillment in your in your day. But the whole kind of here's your job description, and you know check off every day. Yeah. Oh my lord. Yeah. It's not. It's inhuman. Can I inhuman. can I jump on both of that? Inhuman resources. Okay. Well, I, okay. No, I'm, I'm so, fine. I'm so good. I just I just wanted to actually like point out two things what you both displayed. Those were like very good examples. So in the end, um, like installing new work processes, methods, leadership concepts, whatever, is a very very individual approach. It's very need based on on the one hand side on like you said the employees which you are working for. In the end, of course, business has to be. Um, impacted, revenues has to be generated, that's for sure. But on the other hand, you know, I'm not a person, I would say there is no blueprint for new work. It is really, it is really a, a try and error thing. You know, it, it's, it's more about, like you uh, said, it's step back, see what are the needs, how can I deal with the personal needs, what, what's realistic in the setting I'm offering. And um, also, it doesn't matter how you call in the end the job description or not, it's more the thing to really sit down, create some kind of leadership culture in the company and a mindset that you're working with people and then see how to pilot how to test and try that in your specific organization, we won't be all next Google or the next Spotify or whatever, that's bollocks, you know. We all have individual structures and these have to be reflected and also trialed in pilots and that's the only way to go forward, to be honest. So at the end of the day, everything we talked about basically was talk to your people. Because other than if you don't do that, you will never know what they exactly need. So that's the basic of everything, right? When we talk about new work models, there's not really saying, oh, you should do it like this, or all the hotels should do it like this, and all the tech companies should do it like this. No, talk to your people, see what they need, and then you'll know how you specifically in your hotel or in your tech company should do it. You're looking like me, I yeah. want to say something. There's a danger. Ooh. Is that... Mm -hmm. Anytime you ask an employee what they want more, they're going to tell you money. I, no, no, no. Let's, <laughs> now I have to argue because Not I didn't say industry. ask him what does he want more, but in a, in a, we talked about it as well. Like, go have a walk with them and go get food um, with him for, um, for dinner or something else and talk about private stuff. Like, you know, go ahead, ask him in general um, and get to know the people that you work with and they will tell you they will not tell you directly, probably, but in conversation, you will get to know what they want. And sometimes, to jump on this, I mean, there are new models still. We are humans, so motivation works potentially like we know motivation worked always. So this means in self-determination theory, you know it better than me, potentially. Yeah? You say about its purpose, do I have an impact? Do I work at a mission which is a bit greater than I? Can I self-mastery? Can I learn? Can I grow? And the third is autonomy. Do I have some space where I can um, act up on my idea? So the, the point of, uh, in, uh, in, in military, you say mission command. So saying, okay, this is the goal, how you get there, yeah? Because you are much closer to, to what is, is there, um, you know, is there wood, is there tree? Do you have to overcome this and that obstacle? It's up to you. So giving a very clear guidance, I think, in all the new work stuff, and I'm also not so sure if we can work without any job descriptions because at least the mission on what is needed to be accomplished should be very clear. The way how the people then get there. I think those three elements are super important and then you can still think about what are the perks or however you structure the workplace around for the people. Still, what I think is true is that we have to take the human in mind and how human motivation works and tie it together with our value proposition as employer. Because if you no, don't work on, uh, work on the why and position yourself and your brand, so yourself, your company, your mission, and also what you have to offer in terms of those three elements, there are also other models. But those three, I think it's kind of easy and to do for everyone and also to then shape work that needs to be done on site, synchronous in time or asynchronous and, uh, uh, and, and distributed in, 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 in workplace. So, Maybe one thing that's quite interesting right now that's happening in, uh, across various industries is a new approach to actually the employer's responsibility. Uh, we often look at it as, you know, often in a company you've got 
two kind of phases, right? You've got one phase where you're looking for people, one phase where people are looking for you, right? And essentially, in the recruitment phase, to put it re really simple, right? And, but what's really interesting is that actually as, as an employer, you're, you're not just offering a job or in ex you're, not, you're, not, you're not paying someone in exchange of services. Like, this is, this is what, it, you know, what textbook written it is, but the reality is that you're actually offering people quality of life. So what you, the responsibility of an employer is to provide a quality of life for their employees. It, 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 it doesn't really go further than that. If an, if an employee does not get the right quality of life by working in your company, they're eventually gonna leave. And so your role as an employer is then to rethink, am I offering to my employees the right quality of life? And there goes back to your point to circle back it, about asking, all right, so what are the parts of your, of your life that you might be missing from the offer that I'm giving to you. Because we are in a partnership. It's, it's like, you're, in the end, you're not seeing anybody else during that time that you're working in the company. So you need to make sure that, you know, that the whole, that you are fulfilled as an employee, and as well that your employer makes sure that, that, you, are, that you are fulfilled. So there comes the perks and everything. And so um, in 2025, the estimate is that 75% of employees will be millennials. And 50, uh, the Deloitte study recently, 59% uh, placed as one of their top aspirations is the ability to travel and see the world, versus 39, wanting to have a family. So that's the, that's the workforce, and what they want is a managerial structure that can help encourage them with that lifestyle. That's an interesting opportunity for hospitality, A, but it's also an indication of the value of management and what the role, people often say, I left that job because I wanted to get more money. But people leave jobs because they have horseshit bosses. What we know is in hospitality, um, that if you travel a lot, sometimes you end up with a family. I just say that. So there is probably some blending potential there. But, um, I really like what, what that means, because coming from a corporate side, you have rules and regulations or job descriptions. I, I hate job descriptions as well. Sometimes people say it's not in my job descriptions and I have to get the job description in order to see what's in there. And then I add things and I say, I changed it. Yeah. So, but um, my Student Hotel, when I started, they said like, hey, we want that you do with your, with your management team a weekly one-on-one -on -one with each individual manage management team. And I looked at them and said, Good Lord, every week a one-on-one? -on -one? So where you have to go, sit down, so, and do all that? I said, I'm an operational guy. I want my guys to, take, my door is always open. You have something, come spit it out, let's talk about it. And I failed miserably. miserably. I did not even fill out one paper of these one-on-ones. But what I learned is that um, there are parts of the management team, they require that. They want to have that weekly one-on-one. -on -one, and for me, that was the, the approach. I have to give it to them, even I hate it. But if you say, hey, I want every Friday you stepping out of your office, coming with me to wherever, and I have this pile of lists that I want to talk to you about it, I can give it to that. That's my, my addition to what they need. On the other hand, I have people, when I tell him, shall we do a one-on-one, -on -one? I say, nah, nah, I, I talk about it every five minutes when I see you. So a bit answering what they need is exactly what we, what we should change there. And then adapt our procedures, because that's what new work means. It doesn't mean it's because it's written, it's correct. That's exactly what I say. So, and to tackle back on the last thing, why do we have to stick to certain frameworks? Why cannot my head chef be in charge for fucking housekeeping. It's a project task. Make a product good. Make a room look good. Make a food look good. It's the same thing. At the same time, why do I need a front office manager? Why cannot be my service lead, lead as well the people delivering service at, at reception? So if you look to a more project based, and that's what we, hospitality, uh, re well, I don't want to say real, but the hotel people could learn from the tech people, why don't we look more into projects? So your project is deliver a good product. I don't care what's on a plate or in a room. That's your project. And that gives us a new work of hiring people. So do I hire an executive housekeeper or a chef with a background? And it gives me a lot of leverage in hiring new people, probably from a total different industry. So last take, 
We just hired a performance director, even though I like titles. I can always make up titles. So I don't know really. He's a performance director, but he worked, I don't know, 100 years for IKEA. I love that. I love it. He has no clue about hotels, but it's basically the same job. You wear a yellow jacket, and then somebody comes and says, hey, I want to buy a kitchen. Oh, great. I have the kitchen for you. It's exactly what I need. Somebody who, do, who does it. So that's great. You can also exchange the word job description and make it job mission. Still, you would have those stations along your experience for your customers where you say this needs to be fulfilled. However we now call it, it needs to be clear because the whole theory around people need no guidance, I don't believe. So also the crisis has shown us you have but Nobody said that they don't need guidance. Exactly. Nobody said No, no, nobody I, I just said jump on and you, you can now exchange the term in terms of saying, okay, this is, you know, it's not the job as we describe, but the, the mission that needs to be fulfilled. So in, 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 this is exactly to what we said before. The heart of the box the more difficult to find a matching piece. So whenever you're able to change the barriers to the talent that is in front. Example, I have a guy, I hired him from Scandic, amazing brand, I love him. The GM of Scandic called me, he said, I have that guy. He, he, he tried to be hired by you two times. You declined him two times because he's a student and I don't have a, I did not know what to do with him. I said, he, he tried it two times, he's working for me, but he comes to me and said, he wants to work for the student hotel. Why don't you take that guy? I said, send me his CV again. I looked at the CV and said, I have no clue what to do with him. So I called him and I said, Moritz, man, I, I'm, you're a student, I don't know what to do, but hey, what we find some sort of a F and B trainee kind of thing where you do administrative background work. He said, sounds amazing, I want to work for a student hotel. I hired him. I didn't need that role, but I have that role now. So I created something which was inexistent. And I can promise you that guy, he will work a while for us. And that's exactly what we want. Let's make it available for the talent and then give them the role. And missions can, missions can change over the years, right? So you start at something, you're good at it, but then things change. And I think that's also very important because um, if I'm 10 years in the same role, I'll get bored for sure. So I changed my job to every two years more or less, and Daniel actually was clever enough <laughs> to keep me on my toes and say, okay, uh, yeah, HIC, nice, do well done, but now we go to ODA, and now we do this. So um, that's important as well. That's why I always say you need to, to know each and every one and to see what they need especially and what they are made of and what they can do for you that they probably don't even know yet. The point is, Lisa, so th that you don't, so I'm totally with you, you can create jobs, on the other hand, your structure somewhat needs to follow your strategy. You cannot afford of, you know, just saying, okay, I make it happen and then go into this very person-based because you have to have the bigger the companies is. That because you have to have a system in place, this also allows your strategy, and we had said it before, because we all at the end have to have uh, profitability targets that we need to achieve. And then it's, like we said before, like a negotiation in a win-win where you say, okay, I'm willing to enter this path. Do you have, in two years from now, do you have potentially a new mission for me? And you say, this is a path that you can go. And this can be super individual. Still, we need to, from a purely um, company and profitability, and uh, because we, we're not there just, you know, to be um, the caritas, but we have to make money in a, you know, sustainable, profitable way. This is why I think the reality of also the new workforce and the millennials is not that we always talk about, and you know it best, not only do you have a billiard tables and matcha tea, it's also, yeah, it's also about, hey, we need to get things done together, and it's not always, it needs to be life integrated, Still, it's not always fun, even if the development can be super fun. Yeah. But won't they be more willing to do that, to help you? Even though it's not fun all the time, if you are happy, you're willing to help. I don't care. If something breaks down now, I'll go and get fixed it, even though I'm not responsible. They did not apply care. on a farm. So that's always what I say. Somebody that comes to your door, he at least knows a bit of the things you do. So if you're into working outside with cows, you might not end up in a kitchen. It's a very horrendous example, but it's basically what it is. So at the same time, if you don't like to work with meat, you might not be a cook. So at the end, so a bit, I get, I get your point, but you come to a place where we accommodate and host people. I always say we, we host and accommodate the change makers of the future. That's the vision of my student hotel in Berlin. That's, that's the mission and vision that I see. Whether you are on that side of the counter or on that side, you're one of the change makers of the future. Let's, let me provide with you what you need at that moment. And I think if more corporates would have that approach, I think sometimes you would not hire, I, I don't want to bash, but if you look at 80% of the hospitality 
uh, uh, stuff requests or job job requests, however you call it on those websites, they say you need to have an Ausbildung, three years of experience, you need to have this, you need to have that. My first job, after I did my traineeship, I, I became immediately sales manager of, I don't know, five or three hotels in Mannheim. I never forget that. And when I did my first tour, the lady, Andrea Krisaba, amazing woman, she took me around and then she said she was a lady and I was never like a high class guy. So she looked at me and said, do you know that um, this job was actually provided to somebody with six years of experience that was requested? And I said, well, I have not even six days, but I have a tremendous amount of passion to make this a success. When I left that Mannheim Hotel after two years, she was the first one crying. And that's exactly what I mean. I was not the right fit, but I made it happen. And I think we, we, can, we can learn so much from that. Give people the chance. They will fuck up, and then, okay, you sit down with them, hey, that's good, that's bad, how can we adapt? I think we kind of have like a two-level discussion, which is very interesting. I think your case is very much like an ideal pilot we can take a lot and learn from, kind of, you know? And I think still, when it comes to the corporate setting, it's the question of having a people strategy somehow in place. It can be a flexible one, and it can be to really think of the skills which you have at the moment, and a you can- hotel is not an NGO. We are a corporate hotel, huh? I'm, I'm sorry. And, um, and I do know. And, um, and the other thing is to also like think ahead um, and to also say what are the future skills which I have. And this is what I meant by, by piloting, by really trying and really thinking about what are different profiles which could be interesting. How could I experiment with job sharing approaches and so forth. And so I think you do have to come from two sides to really see what do we have now? What are the gaps? How can we close the gaps? Can there be transferable skills? And then to say, okay, digital marketing, for example, a big topic right now, where do you get those people from, you know? And so it's really, how can you like progress those? Or for people management, I think the best thing that you can do is bring people to people management that have not been working in people management, right? So I say, good old HR. So, you know, bring, yeah, bring people that come from a different place and have seen different things and then let's make this modern. So this is the best example. So, I'm so we have five minutes left, more or less, if I'm correct, yeah. Um, and Jackie has some questions. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, everybody. So we have a question from Lila Grunter. She says she has a very different view on uh, what you guys have been saying. She's a young professional who has been looking for a job for eight months in our industry. After about 60 employers, she was close to leaving the industry because she was either not getting a reply or a quick rejection. Send She's me your CV. <laughs> I thought that you would say that. <laughs> There's a few more questions. So what do you think? New Problem. But What's sorry, the but there could be yeah. a reason for that that we cannot determine. It depends a bit on what are you looking for, what do you want to be paid, how yeah. much hours you want to work, where do you want to work. So I'm, I'm, I gotta say, sometimes I sit with staff members of mine where a contract is ending. I would love to keep them on board, and they are unsure, but they don't. You can see and feel they don't want to do what they do, and you cannot make them happy. You, I, I know sometimes I cannot give you. How you say that work happiness, I cannot fulfill. So sometimes, especially younger professionals, have the tendency to rather not change because they, they feel that security at the end helps them. So very often I say, hey, I'm gonna take a call and I hate to do it, but this call is I'm not giving you a contract. Not because I don't want it, because I have a lack of commitment. It's like in a relationship. If the one wants and the other one wants it easy, it is never gonna work. It doesn't matter which gender wants what, but it's never gonna work. So in, in Lena's uh, defense, uh, she says she was getting a quick re rejection, so without even looking at the CV. So maybe you need to look into her CV. <laughs> Lena, send it over to Philip. Another question, new work, does it come with new pay? What do you think? I think yes, and I, I said that before. We will have one hard year now, and the one year hard year is because a lot of these talents have left the industry because they realized, oh, look, it's quite nice from nine to five to sit at the Amazon hotline and take orders. But after, I promise you, after nine months, they will realize, man, shit, I cannot do that for 25 more years. He's listening to that shit every day in six hours. And then you will have those talents that really have the heart of a, hosp of a, hos a hotelier or a hospitality heart. They will come back. And it's our duty, and I look at the other hoteliers who are here, to pay the right amounts then. 100% agree. 
And, and by the way, uh, the part of hospitality that every hospitality person loves is the work. If they're not coming to your hotel or they're not coming or they're, they left the industry or whatever, it's not because of the work. It's because of everything else that's around it. So we have another question. Um, what are your thoughts on work action? So especially in regards of work-life integration. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think that what, um, especially focused on hospitality, um, we should approach the way that we offer benefits, um, you know, different thoughts, uh, the way we communicate with our staff, uh, all these types of things in a way that we really make sure that we can offer them benefits that fit to them and that are also competitive to other industries as well. So offering them wellness solution solutions, offering them the right amount of support or care. I mean, there's burnouts all over the world in every industry, in hospitality as well, when talking about mental health, talking about physical health, offering, you know, when you work in a hotel from, I don't know, in the evening shift, there's no chance you're going to the gym unless you're a gym rat, you know? Because you're exhausted, you need your sleep, but you might, and on, on top of that, you're not always very well paid. So you might want to have some other benefits that can fit to you. And these are the types of things that hotels need to think about. On Thanks. the subject of work-life integration, um, I think it's really great. And we really like to produce a, a, you know, a team atmosphere and really feel like a family. But it can go too far for some people. And it was funny how you had said, oh, if you've got an employee, you want to find out about them, take them out, have a personal night, go out, you know, et cetera. I'm a middle-aged white dude. If I just start wanting to take everybody out to dinner and have drinks with them, it gets creepy. I didn't I'm say in, have I'm drinks in, with them. I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> so, I mean, so this is it's a free dinner balance, though. It's an interesting balance that we have. Free to, dinner? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, guys and ladies, um, I want to thank you very much because, and I want to wrap this up with, yeah, thanking you because I think I learned a lot, which is very important for me because now, Will I work tomorrow? I have to think about it. But on Monday, I will work for sure. And um, I will go back to the office. And I have so many things. Daniel will be really annoyed by me. And I'm so happy about it. So thank you guys very much on all your perspectives. On, uh, and thank you, Jackie, for the questions and all the audience watching.